Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Assemblyman Robert Rodriguez. I represent the 68th Assembly District in East Harlem. And thank you for joining me here for our annual budget town hall on Facebook and online. We host this conversation with the hope of getting your input on the state budget and ensuring that you are informed about the budget process. Just to give a little bit of context about what we're talking about in terms of federal aid, we're talking about $12 billion to support unrestricted aid for the state. We're talking about $11 billion for different counties and cities, including the city of New York as part of that bucket. Nine and a half billion for education. We know what impact this has had to all of our school districts uh, and all of our students. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the educational portion. Two and a half uh, billion for higher education and 1.8 billion for childcare just to name a few areas. And of course, we have to save the MTA and there's another 8 billion there. So roughly speaking, all in almost $50 billion. So I think we're gonna pivot in terms of this conversation and speak about housing. That is perennially one of the biggest issues in the district. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, we have some great guests for us to talk a little bit about um, what this budget means for housing. We have uh, uh, Commissioner Ruth Ann Bisnowskis, the Commissioner of HCR. That's the New York State Division of Housing and Community Re Renewal, which is uh, affectionately known as New York Homes. And then Rachel Fee uh, for the New York Housing Conference. Um, so with that, let's take a moment to uh, switch it over. Uh, and put a, uh, allow our panelists to introduce themselves and put a question out there. So Commissioner, we'll go with you first and uh, talk a little bit about what this budget means for housing in terms of the housing capital plan, the investments in supportive housing, and then the favorite one about affordable housing and, and is it affordable to everybody and how we try to do that. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, I never want to miss a chance to talk about housing uh, and love to talk housing with you, Assembly Member. Uh, so we, um, as people may recall, are in the midst of a five-year housing plan, and we were very fortunate to have the legislature and the governor approve a $2.5 billion um, increase in spending, direct spending for housing uh, four years ago. So we're just about in the last year of that um, and very much look forward to next year at this time talking about a big extension uh, of that plan in the future. But we were very happy to have some incremental capital in our budget this year for supportive housing. Uh, we have a really strong commitment to producing over a thousand units of supportive housing every year for the last uh, for the last four years. And so this additional 186 million uh, in HCR's budget, which is coupled with uh, funding in OTADA's budget for a total of $250 million will allow us to continue that a strong supportive housing uh, production pipeline that we've had so far. Um, so that for us has been the main sort of capital um, piece that came out in the executive budget. How does that translate into actual units across the country, excuse me, across the state, you know, <laughs> upstate, downstate, in terms of tangible developments and, uh, you know, uh, and also since we have you, Mitchell Lamas are also part of that umbrella mm -hmm. or uh, of, of different housing that we create. You can just touch on that as well. Uh, sure. So we've been producing about uh, the, the the housing plan was about 100,000 units over five years. So we're producing about 20,000 units every year uh, of affordable housing. That's a combination of a lot of things. It's new construction of housing. It's preservation of existing housing, including the Jalamas. Um, it is um, uh, uh, first time home buyer uh, home home ownership programs that we run. So it's really sort of runs the gamut. Um, but people, I think, most often see our work when they, uh, hopefully, when they're driving around uh, all the boroughs in New York City and they see our signs up, whether it's a, um, you know, new construction of a 10-unit building or a 500-unit building, and, and same on the preservation side, we really run the gamut from, from small to, to uh, large preservation. So we were a little slowed down in the pandemic last year with some of our production, but we will be back on track uh, this year. So, you know, again, sort of from our overall, we do around the state about 20,000 units overall. We do over 1,000 units of supportive housing also around the state um, every year. And we've had a really strong production um, uh, of, of re, um, both refinancing and rehabbing Mitchell Lamas uh, around the state. I think people sometimes think there's Mitchell Lamas only in the city, but they are also around the state. Uh, we um, have been working our way through our portfolio to make sure that we can put all those buildings on another 30 year path um, of both affordability and capital improvements so they can continue to provide the much needed uh, both affordable housing and also sort of communities. And we really find that our Pichalama buildings are much more than just apartments. They really are uh, communities for people. So we look forward to continuing that. We saw the um, addition of those funds um, in the capital budget um, and certainly would be able to deploy those to Michalamas uh, across across the state. 
And Commissioner, that's just so important when we talk about the 100 million for uh, for Mitchell Lama housing, we have those um, that are significantly, those equal the middle-class housing that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, we also put in 200 million for um, supportive housing and um, additional dollars for, uh, 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 for homeless housing. Can you speak a little bit about how the focus is um, and where they're placed on supportive housing? You know, who are we supporting? What kind of programs? You know, and, and, and how do you, uh, what's their timeline for seeing those deployed? Yeah, so funding for vouchers is always uh, great. You know, we, we uh, run a, a Section 8 voucher program, uh, as does uh, New York City's HPD and NYCHA, um, and together provide, uh, you know, over 150,000 160,000, Rachel probably knows the number better than I do, um, of, of much needed rental vouchers around the state. And so uh, we were really happy to see some additional uh, vouchers come in the federal stimulus bill. That's really important. Um, and that will give a, a nice um, a boost to our ability to provide additional vouchers around the state and any additional funding that comes obviously in the state budget to the extent we plug it right into that same um, Section 8 system that exists around the state only serves to enhance the number of people who um, can benefit from those vouchers. You know, for many people, having a Section 8 voucher is, you know, like winning the lottery, much like an affordable apartment, right? It allows them uh, to have an affordable rent. Uh, and and uh, we passed, is it three years ago now, the um, uh, Source of Income Discrimination Bill, which now makes it illegal for landlords to not accept uh, people based on having a Section 8 voucher. It still is happening. There was an article I'm sure people saw the other day. Um, where those things are happening, but we work very, it is illegal and we work very hard to make sure that it's not happening. So any increase in vouchers is, is really important um, for us and really provides a desperate lifeline to very low income New Yorkers around the state. We oftentimes are pairing those um, in some of our projects so that we can we can provide um, buildings that people can go into and have a project-based Section 8 voucher. And that's also really important to our production. Uh, and so we see those as sort of key parts of the, of the overall plan. And, and Commissioner, you touched on something that's very, very important. The Section 8 voucher provides significant home stability. Um, and maybe just give a quick plug to the Tenant Protection Unit and what they do uh, before we go back to home stability and the different ways we try to do that in the budget. Yeah, so the Tenant Protection Unit is an amazing uh, group of people uh, at HCR who work to make sure that uh, people are following the rules in the rent stabilization system. And they do that two different ways. One is they are looking at data constantly and looking for irregularities in registrations, in rent increases, and then uh, when they find them, investigating them and when they have put um, uh, you know, over 70,000 units back into the rent regulation system that had, that had been um, incorrectly uh, not in a system over the nine years they've been existent. So it's an incredible group, but they also take uh, referrals uh, from the public, uh, from, you know, anyone from legislative officials, um, any, any sort of incoming, we will investigate and look and try to track down to make sure that units aren't leaving the system that aren't supposed to, or that uh, rents aren't being raised uh, in a manner that they're not allowed. Obviously, tenants can file their own cases, but this is really a proactive effort to make sure that we are both responding to incoming from third parties and also just looking at the landscape to look for irregularities. Rachel, can you talk a little bit about what's happening out there? What this proposal is supposed to do? You know, are we meeting the need? How, how can folks really look at, at what's on the table and by when? Sure. Um, thank you, Assemblymember Rodriguez, um, for ha having me on to talk about housing today. And um, thank you for being such a champion for affordable housing and public housing, not just in your district, but across the state. And I think, you know, this pandemic has shown that having safe, decent, affordable housing is necessary for every family in New York. Um, it, it, housing literally saved our lives this past year. Um, and I think we really saw, um, you know, the consequences of not having housing, um, the, the rates of um, the higher death rates around, among homeless populations. And now um, what housing instability looks like for all those renters who have been struggling um, to really um, deal with job loss and pay their rent this year. So, you know, over the course of the past year, 7.4 million New Yorkers have lost employment. Um, as of December, there were still 745,000 um, New Yorkers um, unemployed, ac according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor. Um, and that, that kind of um, 
the consequences of the unemployment and people just making it every month and not having savings to deal with a crisis and not a crisis that has, you know, is going on for more than a year now. Um, but that means that 1.1 million renter households are at risk of eviction right now. And as of last month in January, they owed a total of 2 billion in rent, according to some estimates. So I think we really can't um, underscore the importance of affordable and stable housing and um, really the, the devastation of COVID on housing stability for New York. So we really are on the brink of a crisis. But the good news is that we do have significant aid on the way from Washington. So as you had mentioned, um, we're getting direct rental assistance from the federal government. And the assembly has also proposed in their budget to supplement this. And there is some agreement with the Senate as well that some extra money is also needed. So I think we'll know more as these budget negotiations happen and wrap up hopefully at the end of the month. But you know, right now we have 2.3 billion in rental assistance coming to renters and landlords in this state. Um, there's going to be access likely to additional federal funds as well um, once the once we run through that 2.3 billion. And then as you mentioned, there's another 400 million in the budget proposed by the legislature to supplement those federal funds. And we also see some really important protections in the budget for renters. So um, there is legislation on the table right now for you know landlords that access this fund and get those rent arrears paid that they also are um, agreeing to not evict, to not raise rent for a year, and really ensure that these households that have been through so much really get the housing stability that they need. So all of that is going to be negotiated in the next few weeks, but we are really hopeful that like I said, help is on the way to really deal with this crisis. The state is not the only person who's looking to invest in public housing. I think we know that the federal government is gonna do that as well. Um, and, and that there are conversations currently happening in the legislature about how to do that. Um, so either through, through, through infrastructure package or through what NYCHA is currently proposing in terms of the blueprint. Rachel, can you talk a little bit about that for folks who maybe haven't heard about that conversation yet? We definitely need support from the federal government on this. NYCHA has a $40 billion capital backlog. That price tag of outstanding repairs grows each and every day. The longer we kick the problem down the road, the more expensive it gets to, to fix the boilers, the roofs, and those upgrades desperately needed in residence apartments. So, um, you know, we're also talking to Senator Schumer. We're talking to the whole delegation. We're feeling really good that we are going to get some aid in this next infrastructure package in Washington. Um, we're expecting that those negotiations are kind of happening starting in maybe July, August, and we're hoping that there is a, a bill um, by um, October 1. But I think we really have to um, understand also it's unlikely that the federal government will give us everything we need, right? It's a $40 price tag. So I do think it's important to look at strategies that are going to bring improvements to each and every NYCHA unit. So the blueprint proposal that NYCHA has on the table, I think it's one that residents should really take a look at. Um, it is a way to finance repairs and keep um, public housing public through a Public Preservation Trust. So it will be a new entity totally controlled by NYCHA and the city of New York. And it's a way to move to a rental assistance platform and really um, you know, finance the repairs that are needed. So I think it's a great long-term strategy. And again, keeping public housing public, which I think residents have been very clear that that's a priority for them. Landlords are still harassing tenants. I'm going to take that one separate uh, because that is something that we should not, that should not be happening. And there are various moratoriums that we have put in place on the legislature and on the executive order level to ensure that people should not be harassed, especially during this time. So if anybody wants to talk about that, they can. And then I'll take the second part of that question, uh, which is why not cancel rent? And I think, um, you know, uh, one of the important things to say is the purpose behind um, the rent relief is to do that, but there's no effective way to cancel rent. You can't cancel the obligation that property owners may have on their 
properties or their mortgages. Um, yeah, Ruthann can talk a little bit about, you know, how it all ties together, both rent in terms of, uh, and, and, and the property owner being able to meet their needs in terms of mortgages, property taxes, utilities. Um, so it's, it's not an obligation that can just go away, but it is an obligation that can be met through stimulus. So I just wanna see if anybody can add to that, that, that conversation a little bit. I mean, I can touch on a little bit, and I think it really just highlights the importance of the federal dollars that are coming in in terms of the magnitude, right? I think that the 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 housing system is an ecosystem, right? It is not a standalone landlord um, tenant relationship, and there are um, so many things that rent pays for, including um, property taxes that pay for teachers and firefighters, including uh, supers and porters that work in those buildings and, re and rely on those jobs. Um, water bills, electricity bills, right? It, it isn't, I think people tend to think that rent goes from a tenant into a landlord's pocket and that really isn't the case. And there's so many small landlords who, for whom this is their, um, this is their job, this is their livelihood, right? And they use the funds from, from a small rent a building perhaps to pay their own mortgage on their own home or they pay it to put their children through college or whatever they might be paying it for. So I think the the need is real for rent to get paid because it pays for so many other things. And I think that's why we have all been calling for so long um, to the federal government to come in with resources because the scale of the problem is so large at this point that it needs a federal size solution. So I think, you know, to Rachel's earlier comment about the 2.3 billion, you know, it is absolutely needed. I think as fast as the uh, um, my sister agency, OTADA, um, can get that out the door and we are, will be as supportive as we can. And I, and I think the legislature um, as well, getting the word out when the application opens so people know what it is um, and getting that rent paid to landlords is, is really critical rather than, um, rather than canceling the rent altogether. I think we just want the rent to get paid. So we've covered a bunch of different items. I do want to remind folks that there is um, an hardship um, declaration that can be made that will provide significant protections uh, from eviction. So that is one way to deal with the tenant harassment issue. Before we wrap up, what other recommendations, either Rachel or Ruth, and you have for folks who, for tenants who are being harassed because of this particular issue or hardship? Uh, tenants can always uh, call, I wish I had the number memorized, but I don't, but please go to our website, NYSHCR, uh, uh, and, and look up the resources, the phone number. You can always call um, the Office of Rent Administration and the Tenant Protection Unit uh, if, if, if a tenant feels that they are being uh, treated improperly. There are also resources at the city level. Nobody should have to suffer any harassment in their housing. Mm -hmm. Great, so I think we've covered a little bit of the issues around housing. Uh, I think we uh, also touched on one of my favorite items is, which is continuing to support neighborhood preservation co uh, uh, co uh, corporations. Um, these are nonprofit organizations that provide housing support and resources in our community. Um, so we're able to continue to, to, to support those so that they can continue to provide the support that they needed there. Um, and many of these have translated into um, you know, different wins in our community to help prevent evictions um, you know, under normal times, right? now everyone's operating in, 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 in providing COVID support um, and, and rental support wherever needed. So feel free to give us a call if there are any questions or issues related to that. Um, I think we are running good on time. That gives me a chance to talk a little bit about what we're gonna be talking and teeing up in the next segment. Uh, in the next segment, we're gonna be talking a little bit about education and the arts and how the, this $208 billion budget that we're, that we're discussing uh, impacts those specific areas. Uh, so uh, I do wanna thank and give a moment to uh, acknowledge the contributions of our commissioner who has been working tirelessly to provide affordable housing throughout the state and Rachel Fee who has been a terrific partner and uh, we talked a little bit about strategies for public housing you know she uh, and her organization helped to uh, co-author the bill that we're pushing uh, that we continue to push to take the co-op and condo tax abatement for uh, apartments assessed at over $300,000 and redirect that towards public housing. 
So one of the proposals in the budget is pied uh, If you like pied then you should like our tax abatement program uh, 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 redirect as well. So uh, that's one of the other solutions when we talk about blueprint and others about uh, ways that we can fund uh, NYCHA and fund public housing. It's through that 300 million a year, potentially 3 billion of capital. Um, so uh, we'll, we will continue to fight and advocate advocate that uh, for that, depending on what, what, if, and when, and what we get from the federal government on the infrastructure package. So thank you both for, for being here. Okay. Folks that are, are just tuning in that maybe missed us for the first half hour, I'm Assembly Member Robert Rodriguez. Um, I represent East Harlem in the 68th Assembly District, and uh, you are with us uh, on MNN's uh, Represent NYC um, and on Facebook Live talking a little bit about the $208 uh, billion dollar budget that is currently being examined um, on the state level. For those of who are, are familiar with the timeline, this conversation starts in January with the uh, governor's executive budget and gets picked up uh, around now after the legislature puts forward their, their uh, legislative resolutions. We did that on Monday. Um, and just to provide some context, you know, it is a very different place uh, that we're talking about today than we were two months ago in January. In January, we had you know, uh, a very limited prospect for federal support and uh, significant declines in revenues this year and next. Thankfully, the federal government has come back with significant revenue to help support the state um, this year to the tune of almost $50 billion in a number of important areas, 12 billion, 12.7 going to the state to help this year and next year for lost revenues, which we know we've all experienced because of the high level of unemployment um, that, that our state has sustained. Also 11 billion for different, different municipalities, almost 5 billion of that to New York City. 9.5 billion in education, which um, I'm glad we're going to start talking about now, because Dr. De La Cruz will always shine, chime in on the things that are needed in District 4 in terms of resources. 2.6 billion in higher ed, which I'll, I'll touch a little bit on. Um, and, uh, and as mentioned in the earlier segment, a significant amount for rental assistance to help people who have, uh, you know, as, as a result of COVID, uh, fallen behind on their rent and to help property owners, to help uh, the, housing, uh, the housing economy stay afloat and not displace, uh, the, displace people. And, uh, and the legislature has and continues to take action around a moratorium uh, to make sure that, that we protect people who have been told to stay in their home even when they've lost employment. So with that, let's uh, jump in and introduce our panelists. We have Dr. Christy de la Cruz, the superintendent for District 4, and we have Ana Chireno uh, from El Museo. And I, and I think, uh, you know, Ana is, uh, is going to carry the banner for all the arts organizations, uh, certainly in East Harlem, that, um, you know, have, are facing a very similar reality. Uh, in terms of what COVID has, has, has done to El Museo and, 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 and potentially trying to find that way forward. Um, so with that, um, let me turn it over to, um, to Dr. De La Cruz to introduce herself and, and say a few words. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Assembly uh, Member Robert Rodriguez for allowing me to be in this space with you. I just wanna say that in regard to budgets and education, um, I really wanna commend the entire community for all their support and ongoing advocacy and supporting our schools. As we know, funding is always um, an area of concern. You know, we always want more, uh, especially when it comes to meeting the needs of our, our learners. Um, one area this year, as we all know, 63% um, of District 4 currently has opted for remote learning. And, and with that being said, technology is an ongoing, um, an ongoing area that we're going to have to think about our sustainability plans because now we have devices in the hands of our children, but it's the ongoing maintenance, right? It's um, things, uh, wear, tear, cracking of the screens, chargers, cords. So the technology is going to be something that we're going to have to um, consider, um, not just for this year, but ongoing, you know, for just many more years to come. Um, I will say that on behalf of the, the Department of Education, we're really excited about the, um, 
with the additional funding that we've received that our schools in the second round of budget reviews, they're given a little bit of extra support um, due to some of the register loss that we have faced in the city. And that's uh, not just in district, four, in district four, but the entire city. Um, so right now it looks like all of our schools, they're participating in round two, um, but it looks like that all of their budgets are not gonna have a um, significant impact for right now. Um, towards the end of the year, that's when we actually get the budgets. Usually after Memorial Day is when the budgets for the following year start to come out and under review. The majority of our budgets go to staffing and you know making sure that we have teachers. This year, we've had to invest in a lot of long-term substitutes um, in order to provide that in-person instruction. Um, it does vary per school. Um, however, I will say again, and that's my thanks to the community and, and like El Museo, uh, everyone in the community has really stepped up. We've continued these partnerships. We've had to reimagine things, make things virtual, um, virtual field trips, um, virtual tutoring, um, but slowly but surely as we start to reopen, reopen we are bringing in um, more into our schools. And I, I really wanna thank all of our partnerships, whether it's our community-based partners, our cultural organizations, um, everyone is really, this has been a time where we've had to come together and really think about the, the best interest of our, of our children and our families. So that's where we are now. At our last Community Education Council meeting, um, we had the Contracts for Excellence presentation, um, which really went over the funding and where that's allocated on those main categories. And in the next few months, we will have the fair student funding presentation um, that occurs at your community education council meetings. And that's across the entire um, city, not just district four, but the entire city. But that's just a, a broad brush overview of where we are. But I really wanna just say thank you to um, our elected officials. Thank you to every member of our community for really just stepping up and advocating for us to make sure that we get the resources that we need. And the, the three main areas just to highlight technology, the social emotional learning, and as we talked about the housing and food insecurities that some of our, our members have faced, those are some of the, the main areas, but thank you. Thank you, Christy. I appreciate you highlighting those three things. I'm gonna switch over to Anna to talk a little bit about the experience at Emoseo, and then I'll give the, the data dump. You know, I thought, you know, you got to hear experiences first before we go over everything that's in the budget and, and what that means. So go ahead, Anna. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman Rodriguez, for inviting me to represent not only El Museo del Barrio in East Harlem, but also just the vibrant grassroots cultural community of this amazing neighborhood. Not only if it weren't for the arts, I mean, New York City wouldn't be what it is, a, a global leader. Um, in arts and culture, and as a neighborhood institution, one that's deeply connected to the grassroots, we see so much of our local vibrancy also come from the arts and culture, um, the arts and culture realm. So a little bit about how we're faring. Uh, the New York State Comptroller recently released a report saying that the arts and culture sector in New York City is actually the most affected sector by COVID. We're looking at a sector that it is that is experiencing a two thirds decline in employment, a 66% decline in employment. And that's deeply affected to the state GDP. When you look at pre COVID times, the arts and culture sector was contributing about 7.8% to state GDP. I mean, that's when you look at arts and culture holistically, not just museums, but also Broadway shows the entire tourist hospitality sector in New York City people come to our city to enjoy arts and culture, but also on a deeply local level, we have such an amazing impact, not just economically, but when you look at arts and culture, we're in schools, we're in shelters, we're in hospitals, we're in senior centers. And these are transformative experiences that really connect us to one another and really teach us how to be empathetic with one another. We're, we're learning about ourselves and our communities through these artistic experiences especially when they kind of punctuate through our quotidian life. Um, 
public art is is what makes things um, beautiful, especially in a moment when we're so disconnected from each other and we really need that kind of support and enlightenment and inspiration. The arts are really the sector that can do that. So we're looking at an economic impact, but we're also looking at a health impact, a mental health impact. And really it's the arts are something that strengthens the, the societal fabric in our, in our city. We saw that even especially after 9-11, really what kind of signaled not only to the world and people that visit New York, but really what signaled to New Yorkers that New York City was back on track, back in business, really was when you saw the arts and culture come back. And the state and our partners in government were integral to that process. And we're, we're gonna see that. We, you know, we need our partners in government. We commend the assembly for their proposal uh, their budget proposal, which included um, funding, which Robert will tell us more about. It did include funding for arts and culture, specifically in the revitalization aspect, to make sure that we can keep our doors open. But I do want to speak to small organizations that are really on the precipice of closing. Uh, we could really see a decline, not only in employment, but even in the number of cultural organizations that are able to survive this really difficult moment. And so we really need the support of our partners in government to make sure that they can offer us the stability that oftentimes government does offer nonprofit institutions. We're in a moment when we, we don't know what private funding will look like. Um, there is a lot of competition right now for, for funding. And so we really need the state assembly, the, the state assembly to make sure that we continue to be vibrant and continue to provide services uh, for, for all New Yorkers. Okay. So I'm going to start giving a lot of information in this area because I think we, we we've done a great job of picturing what's happening, our real-time response, you know, what we have done. And MLC has done amazing things, bringing so many things from, you know, the, the, the physical world into the, um, into the virtual realm. And as has been the strategy for almost every nonprofit, you know, and, and before I get into the numbers, I mean, my, 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 uh, my, my son does um, with Los Plederos. And, you know, they have been a perfect example of trying to figure out, you know, how you take something that's very, you know, in the moment, in the person, in the personal physical realm, drumming and singing and dancing and me and bring that into a virtual instruction realm. And I think, you know, both of you are kind of testaments to how you do that um, in a very short amount of time. And, you know, unfortunately with not enough resources. So let's go right into resources. In the educational realm, obviously we talked about $9.5 billion going towards education. You know, it's our um, approach in the budget to, uh, to, to make those investments. We're doing $3.1 billion in uh, general support for public schools um, uh, over the next three years. Um, with that, a significant investment in foundation aid of $1.4 billion with the objective of meeting uh, the, the, the bar set by the Campaign for Fiscal Equity uh, over three years. Um, now, what's important about that is we are also raising revenue in the assembly one house budget so that at the end of that three year period, we can maintain the levels that we're talking about um, maintaining um, as part of meeting that ongoing commitment to the campaign for fiscal equity. So that's the, that's what we put in, into this. And, you know, when we look at past funding levels, um, you know, I, I just want to give people some context, right? We have always put money towards education and towards uh, uh, foundation aid over the last three years. It's been roughly 600 plus million, but in none of those years that I've been in the, in the legislature, have we been able to raise revenues. So, you know, uh, uh, it, it, to a significant degree, either because of Republican, uh, you know, uh, control or, uh, you know, because of a lack of partnership. But we believe now is the precipice to be able to do that. It's obviously a difficult time, but it's a difficult time buffeted by significant federal aid and making investments for the future. So we're looking to do both in this budget. So that's the, the top line education numbers. And as we start to drill down, you start seeing significant support for uh, 10 million for homeless students, 10 million to support mental health in schools, um, all of which are, are, are necessary. An uh, increase in, uh, in pre-K dollars, 75 million for additional pre-K slots, because while we may be okay in New York City, there's some places upstate that do not have full day pre-K yet. Um, so this is looking to meet um, that commitment as well. 
um, My Brother's Keeper, which is an important initiative that Dr. De La Cruz will, you know, probably want to chime in on. Uh, but that has been something that we have been able to continue to fund, and in this case, um, uh, our, our, I have put in almost 108 million dollars since uh, the, the program's creation, and we're going to continue to to fund that. Um, so we reject a number of proposals that were initially put out there to cut resources. Thankfully, because of the support we have and the revenue we're hoping to raise. Uh, for folks uh, who are interested in higher education, I'll give you the quick excerpt before we move to arts and culture. So for higher ed, we're focusing very much on increasing TAP awards. So I think in our budget, we increase it by $1,000 and put additional money to help close the TAP gap, the difference between tuition levels and the TAP award. Uh, we also support the MLK um, scholarship um, uh, and, and also put $180 million towards opportunity programs. Those are the HEOPS, the EOPS, um, the Liberty Partnerships, and some of the other programs that help support higher ed. Um, and we reject at the moment uh, uh, any um, increase to tuition. So we're, we're, we're throwing out everything that raises it. We're throwing more money towards it because we have heard that from our students, it's not enough, especially during the time of COVID, especially when they've had to make certain choices about whether they could, you know, go in person or remote. And some folks have, um, you know, chose to, 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 to do it, to, to do it virtually. Um, and some have chosen to defer and, and, and just to, to figure things out because of the strain and stress of, 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 of this time period. So important for us to mention that. And uh, switching very quickly to the arts, but not to neglect this um, at all in terms of importance. And you know, we put $100 million in, in terms of arts recovery and revitalization program to support the reopening of arts organizations across the state. Um, we also put in uh, $20 million for capital. We understand that people are going to potentially have to sh change their facilities with a prioritization to small and mid-sized organizations. If this is not your first town hall, you have heard me fight about capital over and over again for the small and mid-sized organizations that don't get the big grants and awards that are not the Mets, that are not the Museum of Natural History. So this is uh, continuing to build on that program as well as putting 15 million in operating support for NISCA to continue to support the artists that are trying to create content, you know, and, and, and adapt to, to providing art in this virtual space. Um, so those are a few of the appropriations. And I think uh, we are also talking about a musical and theatrical production tax credit um, so that uh, we can be able to support folks to be able to uh, make investments, um, you know, as as we as we look to to reopen. So those are a few of the things that we have going on in the arts um, and uh, uh, culture space. Um, and, and with that, I just wanted to uh, send it back to the panelists um, to talk a little bit about, you know, what this might mean. So we'll start with you, Anna. Excellent. Thank you for that overview, Robert. Uh, I, I do want to mention that, you know, the arts and culture organizations were the some of the first spaces to close actually in the initial lockdown in New York City, partly because we do serve as, as public facing facilities. And so we were the first to close, but we were actually some of the last sector, one of the last sectors to open. Uh, Mostly it didn't open until September and, at, and then we opened at a 25% capacity. So you see arts and culture being the first to close but the last to open. Uh, and that has affected of course our revenue and our ability to be able to pay, keep our doors open and pay our staff. We have made the transition to virtual um, and we'll need the state to, to support that work. Uh, we really rushed to, to make the transition in order to continue to serve our audiences. At El Museo, we transitioned all of our in-classroom partnerships to the virtual realm. Uh, we have hosted virtual art talks, hands-on workshops virtually uh, with materials that people can find in their homes. We've put all of our educational resources, some of our, some of our curriculum even, online. We've digitized old catalogs from the museum and put that online. So we've really made that transition um, and the funding from NISCA will be extremely important as we continue to do that work. In that transition to virtual, we do see a deep need, not only for El Museo, but for many arts and culture uh, organizations we're hearing that we need 
to pay for your staffers that are able to that are able to navigate the digital realm. Uh, we need tech upgrades for our that are part of our GOS. We need to upgrade our memberships to different online platforms to be able to kind of really produce the highest quality programming that we can. We also need increased money for PPP, for, for personal protective equipment. Uh, we need to make changes to our facilities as you made, as, as you mentioned, Robert. So when we do eventually open in person, we are, we are thinking about continuing in the virtual realm. So we'll need more staff, more resources to be able to do both in-person activities and virtual activities. Now, in terms of NISCA, NISCA is really an amazing vehicle for funding for arts and culture. NISCA affords multi-year grants, which is very rare, uh, not only in government funding, but in all types of funding. Uh, so you're able to plan accordingly, knowing that you'll have a multi-year uh, funding source. They also NISCA also affords a lot of GOS funding, which is some of the toughest parts of our budget to fundraise for. Uh, so we're really grateful to NISCA in that regard. And we're really grateful to the State Assembly um, for their role in holding NISCA uh, complete in terms of its funding this past fiscal year, which was so, so difficult. But I do want to mention that NISCA funding was maintained at the same level but NISCA funding has seen a downward decline, a downward trend in terms of its allocation. So the peak uh, funding for NISCA was in 1971, and it was at $131 million in current dollars in 1971. But after the 2008 collapse, financial collapse, you did see a shrinkage in, in NISCA funding. Um, now we're, only, we're almost seeing a 40% decline in NISCA funding. Um, and while we are eternally grateful for that funding, we do want to see that as our economy betters, even in this difficult time, uh, we're great. We're hopeful that we'll be able to see an economic turnaround. We do want NISCA funding to increase its pie, right? It funds so many organizations all across the state, but we really need to see an increase in that in that NISCA allocation. In terms of NISCA, we also have some some uh, funding recommendations for how the proposed increase on the assembly could be used. We wanna see an increase in NISCA's administrative capacity. We, we, we hear from NISCA that they see an increase in the volume of applications. So we wanna be, we wanna see NISCA be able to kind of handle that increased volume. We wanna streamline and simplify the application process. As we have smaller staffs, we see um, we see that the applications have become onerous, and so we want to see that streamlined, especially the use of grants gateway, which I'm sure you've heard, Assemblyman, is very difficult to navigate. So we want to see that streamlined. We also want more unrestricted funds, which NISCA and, and Mara Manis has been really a thought leader in this regard and understands how unrestricted funds um, are useful to organizations, and we can manage those, uh, those funds in a way that betters how we serve our communities, but we do want to see NISCA attempt to kind of be a, a leader in that realm in providing unrestricted funds. We also want to see more organizations included that are not current NISCA grantees. And so we, we know that NISCA has the, um, has the wherewithal to, to really kind of think about these changes. And we really need voices like you, Robert, to be able to make sure that, that NISCA is responding to the needs on the ground. Thank you, Anna. And as we wrap up the education segment, I just want to go to Dr. De La Cruz and, and give you the last word. What does reopening look like for, for, for us in District 4? Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, reopening, I, I'm really proud to say that um, even right now, all of our schools are providing five days of in-person instruction to at least some of their groups of students. Um, we do have eight schools that were approved for um, a school-based option to have one remote learning day per week just because of the, the staff teaching multiple modalities. And when I refer to multiple modalities, that means that they're teaching both in-person and remote or two groups. And so that's why those school-based options were agreed upon. Um, but we do have we have put in systems and structures in place to ensure the health and safety of our students and to um, open our schools um, successfully. Um, as we, you know, really, but we still have 63% remote, right? So that's, that is something that we are, you know, wanting to make sure that we still adhere to CDC guidelines. Um, and we're still in the planning phases for what September will look like. I know a question that comes up is will 
will parents and students still have an option for remote? Um, we do have some students who um, are actually thriving in the remote setting. I know we always talk about the in-person, but there are some students. Um, I just had a student advisory on Monday, so I heard voices from that perspective. And then we have some students that are really um, eager for the in-person. One thing that's really come up with the community though from students, staff and parents is we have some people who have not been in a school building for almost a year. It'll be a year and a half by September. So as a community, we are thinking about, well, how can we do orientations, bridge programs? We're gonna need additional um, social emotional supports to transition our, our um, all, all people, right? Our young people, our parents, um, our staff as well, because we have staff members who haven't been in this school for uh, a year and a half by September. So it's really making sure that we provide those supports to set everyone up for success. Um, and so that, that's where we are right now. And, um, you know, of course, partnering with our community, there has been a huge emphasis with the social emotional. And I just want to, you touched upon this, um, Robert, about the my. Uh, my brother's keeper grant um, we did as a district apply for the 2021 2025 my brother's keeper family engagement grant um, and so those grants are vital to um, providing those professional learning opportunities for all of our members of our community parent coordinators parents um, and so I, I just want to say that those grants are vital to also being a part of our reopening as well, because we wanna include every constituent in this process because we all have, you know, our hopes and fears and we really wanna set up everyone. <coughs> um, we have, the DOE has secured, they still have iPads and so forth. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to think of all areas and right now we're in the, the planning and preparation phase. Um, but for us, it's going to really depend on um, whether staff members have are able to have reasonable accommodations and whether parents can select for remote because then that changes the the logistical aspect of the scheduling and programming and how can we ensure that everyone is set up for success but um, like I said I know I always go back to those three areas but it really is about the technology the health and safety and and also just the ins instruction right and the social emotional how do we because the social emotional and the instruction go hand in hand right um because if we know just the importance of the 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 mind and the body um in setting us up for success and the arts have a big play in that as well i just i see anna and i get excited because we know that the arts are so important for our young people because it brings joy. We have to bring joy and hope um, back into everyone's life, right? And that's what we're doing. So thank you. Thanks, <laughs> thank you for this space again. I really, really appreciate being a part of the conversation. And I just really want to thank everyone, you as well, um, Robert, for just your ongoing advocacy and support for our community. So thank you. Thanks, Dr. De La Cruz. And it's by design we put arts and education together because those partnerships are foundational to our community. And, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had that conversation in a way that that uh, that folks know that we are intentionally focusing on both of those areas because they are the way that we, you know, help restore, um, you know, uh, our sense of normalcy, self identity, strength, uh, and, and learning. Right. So, um, with that, I want to thank you both for being with me, uh, being here with me this afternoon as we transition to the next panel. Um, we're going to be um, addressing criminal justice and the social service uh, safety net. Um, so. Thank you all, and uh, I'll, I'll welcome our next two panelists to, to hop on. Uh, joining us, we have David Nascenti from Union Settlement and uh, Julianne uh, Harris-Calvin from the Vera Institute. Um, and for the folks who are coming in uh, a little bit late um, or just jumping in for this segment, I'm Assemblyman Robert Rodriguez, and thank you so much for being here with us with uh, MNN's uh, NYC rep represent NYC uh, and our Facebook Live where we're having our annual budget town hall conversation. Uh, for folks who are not familiar with the budget process, uh, the executive uh, budget is put out by the governor in January um, and we go through the process of examining that 
uh, and get to the point where this week on Monday, we passed our, our legislative resolutions, making the legislature's recommendation on what we think the budget should include and how that differs from the executive budget. Um, and just a point of context, where we started this conversation in January, we are in a very different place. In January, we had no idea if we were gonna get federal stimulus and to, you know, what degree we would get any. So there were significant cuts across education and healthcare and, um, and, and pretty much across the board based on revenues that, that we knew were, were declining. Today, we've, we have a very different picture. We've received almost uh, $50 billion in, uh, in federal aid. Um, and just to recap briefly, 12 billion in unrestricted aid to help the, the state revenues, 11 billion to municipalities, nine and a half billion to education, which we talked about how we were gonna do that and utilize that in the last segment, 2.6 billion in higher education dollars, which goes towards TAP and closing the TAP gap, amongst other things, 1.8 billion in childcare, which we are going to focus on in this segment, um, as well as uh, earlier had some conversations about rental assistance, $4 billion on vaccine and testing, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next segment for, for health. Um, so that's just a broad overview of what the federal government is contributing to this conversation. On the state level, we are looking to uh, raise $7 billion in additional revenue uh, from those that we think are most able to help support that, generally millionaires and above and corporations, uh, to help support what we need, what we also recognize is going to be important future investment and recognizing that um, you know in the past uh, we had not been able to take certain measures to make investments in, in vital areas. So uh, with that backdrop, let's uh, introduce the, the, the panelists to kind of talk a little bit about um, these other areas of the budget, which are no less significant uh, in terms of what they mean to our community. Um, so some of the things that we're gonna uh, cover focus on food access and food insecurity. We're gonna talk a little bit about marijuana legalization, what that means in terms of um, either the, the, the budget or future revenues, um, unemployment related issues. So separate from what we talked about, there's $22 billion in additional unemployment aid that's gonna to go uh, to help support folks who um, are, 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 are currently still experiencing unemployment. Um, but what we have done uh, is talk about an expansion of uh, support to excluded workers, you know, folks uh, who are part of our communities, undocumented, uh, who've received no aid up to this point. Um, uh, and, and also talk a little bit about other community related elements around incarceration, um, gun violence pr uh, prevention, and some of the work that, that, that comes out of uh, these kind of investments in our community. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to David Nascenti for uh, a, a few comments. Great, thank you, Robert, um, for pulling this, pa this panel together and the entire uh, day's uh, um, sessions together. I was listening to the early ones, it's really fascinating. So I wanna thank you and your colleagues. Um, and before talking about um, just some quick background for those of you who don't know, Union Settlement has been in East Harlem since 1895 and we're the oldest and largest social service provider providing everything from early childhood to seniors. And I, and I wanna emphasize something that the Sullivan said, which is raising revenues. Because in the past, it's always been the pie is so large and everybody has to fight over the last slices of the pie. Um, and social services was often left after the pie plate was empty. And so, um, you know, can't emphasize enough the importance and thank you and your colleagues, Robert, for um, looking to do um, higher taxes on wealthy individuals so they can pay their fair share so that there is a larger pie, hopefully this year, uh, that we'll be able to use for these important services. Um, and I also want to talk about this because you mentioned it as social services and the safety net. So there's many layers to the safety net. So people obviously think, okay, with your, you're laid off from your job, you get unemployment. That's part of the safety net. But people forget that often some of the basic services, safety net services aren't available to everyone. Like a lot of the federal stimulus dollars are not available to undocumented individuals. So there's no safety net for them. And so I want to really applaud the assembly <laughs> in its budget proposal, providing funding for individuals who are not eligible for the federal relief funds. Um, and then a second layer is really um, keeping people from falling into the safety net. So um, one of the prior panels was talking about rent relief. So if people are 
you know, in their homes, but they can't pay their rent and they're going to get evicted, then they've got to turn to the safety net of homeless shelters. But we don't want that happening. And so that's another important level. And you mentioned child care, which is crucially important so that people can work, so that they can put food on the table, so they don't need the safety net. And then the third level, which I <clears throat> talk about a lot, is the sort of like the forgotten, how to get people farther away from the safety net. So in there, I talk about things like job training and adult education. So if you have someone who you know, is ready, willing, and able to work but lacks language skills or lacks literary skills, and you give that person the adult education and the, and the skills and education that they need, then that person has moved farther away from falling into the safety net. And so it was like a sort of like the three you know, really important layers. And it's really particularly important in a community like East Harlem because there's so much need you know, a third of the people live in, <clears throat> in public housing, you know, large unemployment, lots of immigrants, immigrants, you know, people think of it as El Barrio, but the fastest growing population is actually Chinese. So this is a multi-ethnic, you know, multilingual uh, neighborhood. And, uh, you know, the state funding is, is crucial for those types of um, services. Uh, and the other thing to remember is people think also of, you know, like unemployment checks go directly to individuals, but there's other aspects of state funding that are so crucial. And the one I'm going to mention is like Medicaid funding. It's a massive part of the budget. Union Settlement, um, among other things, does mental health counseling, which is Medicaid funded to keep people stable, keep them in their homes to address the huge, you know, you know, poverty is trauma. And then this past year has added a lot of trauma. So it's a huge need there. So I want to also make sure that people can focus on you know, additional funding for Medicaid so that we keep some of those programs uh, continuing. So, you know, I could talk for a long time, so I'm gonna pause there, but those are some of the, sort of like the highlights and why, um, you know, the state funding is so crucial for social services and for the safety net to fund senior programs, advantage after school programs, you know, um, you know, adult education programs, et cetera. And then also things like the Medicaid funding um, that are part of it. So I'm gonna pause and I'll let you turn it over to Julian and or ask any other questions you have. Oh no, we're going to have many questions because okay. uh, we're going to be covering a lot of ground in this conversation, um, and one that we're not going to neglect that always kind of that that falls under this umbrella a little bit is small business support. And, and David, I, I just want to make sure that when we talk about all the other services, yeah, I, I don't forget to to mention that um, focused and targeted on small business support, the assembly has put in a billion dollars towards small business reopening and a relief grant program. So uh, we'll, we'll circle back around to that. But I mean, that, you know, there may be no other place in this conversation that we talk about small business. I just yeah. wanted to make sure. Yeah. As you know, really Union Settlement has a small business center. And, you know, when we circle back, <clears throat> we'll make sure to mention the Isle of New York restaurants proposal as well. Oh, you know, we will. So, Julian, about that conversation around the social safety net is not one that lives in a vacuum. And the work that Vera has done in terms of making sure that during the crisis, we don't forget about you know, the incarcerated, that we continue to deal with the issues around criminal justice reform, the safety, um, the, the savings associated with it. And then also, I think, you know, thinking about it holistically, the revenues associated with potentially you know, marijuana legalization. But please tell, tell us a little bit about Valvira and what you're working on. Sure, thank you, Assemblyman. So at Vera Institute of Justice, I run um, the Greater Justice New York program, which is Vera's criminal justice reform work that's very specific to the state of New York because Vera started here in New York City um, and started with actually bail reform 60 years ago. And we have really started to jump into budgets. And so this conversation is very timely for us because um, as you mentioned, budgets are places where we can both find revenue like the $350 million that you could potentially save um, through the marijuana legalization um, legislation that is now moving uh, through Albany. Um, but also you can take money that we already use and spend and reinvest that money out of the carceral system and into communities, into programs, just like the ones that uh, David was mentioning a minute ago and that you brought up earlier in your other guests to talk about. And the lens with which we, um, through which we look uh, at budgets is budgets as moral documents because we feel that they illustrate what we care about as a society, as a community, as a state, who we care about and how we will care for them. And what we've seen over the past decade or so is that despite an incarcerated population that has fallen by more than half in the last decade, 
We've continued to spend billions of dollars at the state and local level on incarceration. And this is money um, that we've already mentioned <laughs> could be used um, in better ways to invest in communities most affected by both crime and over incarceration, but also, also notably that these are the same communities who are suffering the greatest effects of COVID-19 economically and in terms of health consequences and in the weakening of our formal and informal social support networks that we've talked about this whole, um, this whole uh, meeting today. And so the things that we need to do moving forward are three categories of things. First, we need to continue to decarcerate through legislation and reentry supports. Secondly, we need to continue to shrink the footprint of the carceral system that is not shrinking um, in the same time as the populations, and then reinvest in community-led evidence-based solutions to public safety, um, which you've done a great job of highlighting and supporting yourself, Assemblymember. member. Um, and what's great is that this year's budget um, actually illustrates how you and your colleagues in Albany um, are committed to caring more about supporting communities and making them more stable over punishing and incarcerating them to no real proven public safety benefit. So as we just mentioned, there's $350 million in potential revenue with marijuana legalization and regulation, right? But also in the budget, um, one thing that folks aren't um, aware of is that the counties um, are all required to maintain their own jail and they're required to staff their jails uh, commensurate with the maximum capacity of the jail. So in this year's budget, um, there's a proposal to change those regulations so that we can save money on staffing by tethering staffing to actual jail populations, which are much, much smaller than they were a decade ago. And so at the Vera Institute, we have calculated that we could send out, outside of New York um, City, the counties can save uh, $638 million by just changing their staffing regulations and um, connecting them to their actual declining jail populations. Um, and we're doing some of that analysis in New York City too. We spend $2.2 billion on New York City jails. Um, and that is because we are an outlier when it comes to spending on incarceration. We spend more than any other major city to incarcerate far fewer people. So that money can be reinvested, you know, a billion dollars potentially could be reinvested in East Harlem in the programs that um, David runs and talked about in the kind of programming that you assembly member have highlighted and have committed your work to. And so that is just um, kind of a, a nutshell of, <laughs> of what uh, we think we can save with our existing spending, but also the revenues we can get from um, new, new uh, legislation around marijuana. And Shillian, and I think what's important here is the, you know, the whole conversation around marijuana as it exists in the legislature is really a differential between how we provide social equity and reinvestment in communities and participate in marijuana legalization. If you're for it, and it seems like many people are, then you know the real question is how does that get implemented in a way where uh, communities like East Harlem that have been targeted uh, you know, uh, disproportionately are able to participate in this new economy in a real meaningful way. Um, you know, so uh, uh, my colleague, Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes has a bill um, that we are very strongly supportive of you know, in the legislature um, that addresses this in a way that we think makes sense. And, and that really has been the whole rub between you know, getting agreement between uh, uh, that that's the route to go versus what's been proposed. Yeah, if I can just jump in, I just want to reemphasize something that Julian said, referred to, and that's the connection between these two issues. So like people think, oh, social services, safety, net criminal justice. But if you think about yeah. the disproportionate impact of marijuana West on black and brown communities, first of all. And then you think of the number of individuals who are incarcerated pre-trial. So they're not guilty of anything. So they are there, um, can't make bail. So bail reform has been extremely important, but you know, couldn't make bail, couldn't support their families, lose their jobs. Then they need the safety net funding for what, right? And so really criminal justice reform and ensuring that individuals are able to, you know, Take care of their families, able to work, able to be, you know, productive members of society are so inextricably linked. And it's just like really important that we not lose that connection. Thank you, David. I think that's very prescient and, and helpful to, to talk about how that connection binds us. Um, 
So let's talk a little bit about COVID pandemic and, and, and what is in this budget to help address that. Now, David, you know, food insecurity has probably been one of the biggest issues that, that came to the forefront as a result of COVID and, and people being forced to stay in their homes. Um, you know, we have seen an explosion in terms of the support uh, needed for food banks. Um, you know, I think we have increased uh, almost $50 million for the Nourish New York program um, to help provide uh, more support um, to, to, to food banks, pantries, um, and et cetera. Um, and, and, and along those lines, one of the proposals that you know, really came from Union Settlement and the work that you do and the work that you've done um, uh, with, uh, with World Central Kitchen and, and with the different organizations is, is what we call this um, I Love New York Restaurant Initiative. Um, so it's $25 million currently in our one house proposals focusing on building on that model of providing, uh, of having restaurants who are currently in, in desperate need of recovery uh, resources, um, you know, and and uh, and being able to reopen and giving them an opportunity to make and provide meals for folks suffering from food insecurity. Um, and this is a uh, this is a program that thankfully President Biden agrees with, signed an executive order in February, and now, now FEMA is allowed to provide a hundred percent of the costs towards that program um, to help make sure that restaurants can provide meals to those who need it and help everybody get back on their feet. So that's the proposal that's out there. If you like that idea, you know, uh, we'll, we'll put the information in the chat for you to make sure that, you know, you, you let your voice be heard, send it to the governor, send it to leadership. This needs to be in the final budget. That's what, that's what this entire process is about. Budget's not done. It's not done till April 1st. It's the time for our advocates to come out there and talk about what's in there, what's good, and 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 uh, and take the moment. But David, talk to us a little bit about food insecurity. Just to start with uh, that, I love New York restaurants proposal. You know, we've signed on to it. You know, at the beginning, um, all the restaurants closed, um, and these were restaurants, the small businesses that had very low margins to begin with. All the cooks were laid off, the deliverers, the, you know, everybody was laid off and it was a huge impact. Uh, we got some private funding um, and it was simultaneous with, you know, this, you know, the city going through hundreds and hundreds of deaths every day from COVID. We got some private funding to connect about 20 some restaurants with Metropolitan Hospital because the workers were there 24 seven and they couldn't go outside to eat. It was so busy and there was nowhere to go. So we helped keep the businesses open by providing the food. And so to expect, and that was for $100,000. So $25 million is a really remarkable figure um, and will really allow some of these um, restaurants to stay open and to provide food to those who need it. Um, food was the number one issue, no question about it. People, you know, lost their jobs, they had to stay inside, um, and they were desperate, really. Union Settlement is, had never been a food pantry. We have some great food pantries in East Harlem, New York Common Pantry, Little Sister the Assumption has one, uh, but we created what we called a general store, and so we purchased food and got donations of food and provided uh, not just food, but um, basic necessities, diapers, baby wipes, you know, um, cleaning fluids, all these things that you really couldn't get. So we opened a two day a week and we had people sign up and they lined up around the block, which really showed um, how much insecurity there is. And even though the economy is opening up, we're not back to 100%. And the unemployment rate is still really high, particularly in low income communities and particularly among individuals who are undocumented. Those jobs haven't come back. Broadway hasn't reopened, the hotels haven't reopened. And so there's so much need that's still out there. And food security has to be one of our number one concerns. And along those lines, it's just so important to be able to get the restaurant sector, you know, moving back into place. They hire so many people, um, you know, it's, it's not just, um, you know, and we know that that reopening process is not going to happen overnight, whether we're talking about 20%, 25%, 50% of indoor capacity, they're going to be operating, you know, on a limited basis for a significant amount of time. But the quickest way for us to be able to kind of um, uh, get some uh, some value coming out of out of this industry is to be able to support them you know in, in what I think is a real novel way in, of, of helping us to do that so I thank you all thank you for your support on that so switching to small businesses not just the restaurants right we you know we, we, we we're, we're fighting for them too but you know our Main Street businesses have all seen an impact um, David talk a little bit about you know the work that you've done on the business incubator side the the you know, again, many of the proposals that we're pushing here 
have been tried and true. You know, the I Love New York Restaurant Initiative, we did it, it worked. Now we're just scaling it up for the whole state. You know, when we talk about the uh, the small business grant program, I'm gonna let David, you know, do the, the, the unveiling, but we did it, it worked, we're scaling it up. David, go ahead. So, and first of all, thanks to you. Um, thanks to council member Diana Ayala, thanks to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, we were able to obtain $4 million for an East Harlem small business grant program. And that literally kept these businesses alive. Um, we gave them up to $20,000 or three months of operating expenses, whichever was lower. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it was just to keep them alive and allow them to make it through the summer, the fall, and into now. Um, we had, I think, 600 different applications. We've already given away like 3.2 of the $4 million. And this is a grant program. So this was an opportunity for people to just keep their businesses alive, continue to pay the rent, continue to you know, pay, give some money to employees just to keep everybody going until things are able to open up. We're not back to 100%. You can't have 100% indoor dining at this point. And so this is gonna be needed for a long time. And again, it's not just restaurants, it's all the you know, nail salons, hair salons, dollar stores, all these places that really had to close um, and people were staying in and they were not shopping. And so, you know, until um, the retail sector gets revitalized, which is the engine, particularly in places like East Harlem, this is uh, a, a community of small businesses. Union Settlement is the third largest employer in East Harlem with only 350 employees. Most of them have five, six, 10, two. And so the ability to keep these businesses alive, keep them from shuttering has been really, really important and really looking forward to hopefully the passage of this new grant program to allow us to keep this going. Yeah, I mean, that's critically important. That's, you know, how we're going to get ourselves, you know, back up. And even, you know, we're fortunate that we had these resources. Other parts of the state do, did not. And even with these limited resources, we know that it wasn't enough. PPP wasn't enough. Even another round of PPP is going to be needed just to get us to the other side. So I think this billion dollars is critically important, you know, plus what, what we have in abeyance, uh, you know, from, uh, from future PPP participation and other uh, federal stimulus programs will hopefully get us, uh, you know, through, through the summer as we increase our, our level of vaccination. But moving on to um, mental health, um, and I think that's you know, a, a, a theme amongst, you know, whether we're talking about criminal justice reform issues or, um, or just now, I think, you know, one area that we've tried to restore money um, is I have to give a shout out to my folks who have developmental disabilities, OPWDD. Um, the disabled community has been, you know, on the, on the, on the, short end of the stick for many years in terms of investment. They've been cut a little bit here every year. And I think, you know, one of the important areas around that um, is also um, the human services COLA, right? Because the human services COLA touches not just the social services component, um, this, this also touches OPWD and it's probably one of the biggest um, ways that we can help support both of these social service safety net areas. And really it's a, it's a fancy way of saying, you know, you've got to make at least minimum wage in order to keep these jobs because they're hard jobs. And you got to choose between, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, an, an easier job or taking care of somebody disabled for $15 an hour. You might go for the easier job than this job. So that's, that's part of what, what, what the COLA does, but then the COLA also makes sure that we have cost of living increases that have been neglected for many years to help bring these up to livable wages. Um, so I'll let David talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, but I'm actually gonna to defer to Julie because these are, again are so closely Either connected way. and she's gonna know better than I am the statistics of the number of individuals who are incarcerated who have mental health issues. And these are solvable issues. You know, these are, these are issues, if you get people care, if you get them diagnosed, you connect them with a therapist, you find medication, this is what Union Settlement does. You know, this is why, you know, Medicaid funding is so important for low-income populations. You then save a lot of money on the other end. So Julian, just wanted to talk briefly about the criminal justice connection with mental health and the incarcerated populations. Certainly. Um, so, David's right, you know, I think one thing that is not just a New York issue, this is a, a, an issue across the country. I'm a former public defender. I've seen it myself in my practice. 
Um, we have used jails and prisons as a solution to a lot of our um, societal challenges, including physical health issues, public health issues, homelessness, mental um, health concerns. And what we end up seeing is that, you know, the, the population within our jails and prisons that are folks who are struggling with mental health concerns is much higher than the percentage of the general population. Because as David just mentioned, we are spending, and as I mentioned before, we are taking billions of dollars to incarcerate our way out of some of the um, other ways that our, our government and our social service safety net isn't able to answer um, these concerns. We're just like, incarcerating our way out of actually um, committing ourselves and our public dollars into um, providing the services that David talked about to actually having a nuanced approach, an individualized approach. And so a lot of folks who are incarcerated in New York City, but across the state and the country, are folks who are suffering from mental health concerns and with criminalized um, mental illness to a certain degree. And so, like you know, I mentioned before, if we take these billions of dollars, these millions of hundreds of millions of dollars in cost savings by shrinking the carceral, the physical carceral footprint. Um, because we do have a shrinking jail population and a shrinking prison population, we can invest in the kinds of services on the front end um, that, that, that actually help folks get what they need in terms of psychiatric care and medication, physical health care and, and, um, and uh, medication, um, employment services, housing services, um, I think all of these are kind of wrapped up together and, I, and what our system often does is try to take an individual approach instead of having a, um, a connected social safety net and prison and jail seems to be where folks fall through the cracks in that um, and it doesn't have to be. David, was that a yeah. good response? Yeah, excellent. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the other thing I want to note is we don't utilize the time that people who are incarcerated the elimination of education programs, the elimination of, you know, substance abuse programs, the elimination of, you know, you should be able to get a degree or improve yourself, learn English, do all these things that if you invested in these individuals, because 99 point some percent of people who are incarcerated are going to get out. <laughs> and you can have them job ready or not. And the fact that we really don't invest in these individuals um, during that time period is really a societal failure because we could spend the time while they're there, they're, they're motivated to do it, let them come out, connect them to jobs and reduce the re recidivism rate. But for whatever reason, we're not investing in the individuals and not investing in the systems that we are confining. So we have these people who are confining them and then we're choosing not to invest in them and to reduce the recidivism because that's gonna be more victims. So it's really you know protecting victims as well. Um, and that's another issue where I think that if we're gonna move some of the funds out of the, of the you know, the jail systems, that's fine, but maybe we should reallocate some of the funds that are in those systems to um, put funding toward education and other services um, for those who are incarcerated. Yeah, and just to your point, David, in New York City specifically, 86% of the Department of Correction budget is just on jail staffing. So we're spending, you know, $2 billion a year, and most of that is not going to programming and services. Um, federally, they just passed the Pell Grant reinstatement um, legislation that now allows folks to get funding to go to college while they're incarcerated, which was, which was taken away from them for quite some time. Um, there's currently legislation in Albany, and I think Assemblymember, member, you might be able to, to speak more to this, but um, to reinstate the tuition assistance program for college access. Um, and that would save us 22 to 27 and a half million dollars while also helping to fund educational programs for folks who are incarcerated in New York State prisons. So you're absolutely right. We're not spending these billions of dollars on what we need to spend to make sure that folks are prepared to re-enter successfully. And there's two sides of the coin. You have to make them eligible for the funding but you have to provide the courses that allows them to utilize the funding. And if you go into any jail, if any prison in the system, in the state right now, 
you're not going to have any college courses being offered to you to, for individuals to utilize the Pell Grants, and that's really a tragedy. No, it's astonishing. I mean, we're a big fan of the BARD program. We'll give them a shout out um, here, but uh, know that they have done nothing with state money, right? Everything that they've done is with private philanthropic dollars. So, you know, we certainly need to continue to support them. And I think one of the investments that I want to highlight, because it's so significant in the criminal justice areas around gun violence prevention, and I think in our one house budget, we put in $40 million additionally. That's probably like, you know, that's the biggest investment we've done in, in, in gun violence prevention work um, I, I, in, in a single year. And I'm, I'm happy that we're going to be able to do snug and give and, um, and, and really invest in, in programs that help interrupt violence in our communities, um, help make it safer rather than, you know, targeting, um, you know, targeting resources in, in ways that we know are counterproductive. Um, so just to, to kind of bring us to, to uh, a little bit of um, topics that are front and center in people's lives um, additionally is childcare and seniors. And I, I joke because my life currently revolves around child care and the lack thereof, right? I mean, if they're in school, we're okay, sort of, even if it's hybrid, if there's nothing, it's, it's, it's just, we're holding it together with smoke and mirrors. And I'm sure many of our parents are feeling that way every day. And of course the impact on mental health and strain to families is, is evident. But I think, you know, thinking about that and providing support for child care and $1.8 billion is definitely a highlight of this budget. Um, you know, and so um, I wanna mention and give David, an opportunity to talk about what does child care look like now? How is it done? What does this do for it? And one of the other initiatives, because it's almost like, you know, you can't, you know, our seniors are, are, are an important part of that child care spectrum for many of us in our own families. But what we noticed during this pandemic is that they have been increasingly isolated and the lack of technology um, you know, is pervasive in terms of their ability to get access to food, deal with food insecurity, be able to address vaccine uh, signups and the ability to get vaccinated. So, you know, one of our initiatives is this digital 15 million for a digital inclusion grant, which includes being here for nonprofits to be able to access, um, you know, state dollars for, uh, for, for technology for iPads. Um, so I flagged that for folks because it came out of the discussions that we had here in East Harlem. You know, we saw it happen for NYCHA residents on a very limited basis and said, you know, that, that that's someplace, that's something needed everywhere. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll open it up to anybody to comment. In because Zenith you know, Settlements, um, both the largest provider of early child education in East Harlem and the largest provider of seniors uh, services. Um, and there's, you know, Two populations. There was the ambulatory population of seniors who would come to senior centers, and that was their second home. Those were their friends, and those were the people they spent time with, and we would feed them lunch. And so suddenly that ended. It ended a year ago, and it hasn't reopened because that was the most vulnerable population. So those individuals staying home, being isolated, not eating well, getting depressed is a huge issue. And so we've incredibly ramped up essentially a virtual senior center where we're providing programming. We're calling people just to make sure they're okay. Continuing the meals on wheels, we do over 500 home delivered meals every day. But that's gonna be really important because it's gonna be a while before we open the senior centers up because of the isolation of that population. And they don't have the technology or can't use the technology or don't have the Wi-Fi. By. And so union settlement staff members are calling them getting the information, signing them up for, um, for vaccines so that they can go and get vaccinated. And then on the flip side, of course, is childcare. And I wanna talk about subsidized childcare because childcare is expensive um, and it's unaffordable for low-income individuals. And um, the Head Start program, which is this wonderful program, which pays for the childcare, the income thresholds are way too low. You really, you know, you're making less than a living wage um, less than minimum wage, actually, you still have to pay for child care. So um, union settlements, child care centers are open. If anybody's listening and they need child care, they can check our website and reach out. Um, we're having, you know, essentially blended where there's um, both in-person and remote, and we're looking forward to continue to bring more children um, back. But that's the way parents can work if they can drop off their kids for child care. And it's important for the children. It's important for their socialization skills, for their sharing skills to get them kindergarten 
kindergarten ready for their language skills. So many children are being cared for in the home by a grandparent or somebody else who might not speak English. And so, you know, it can't, it's so difficult to go to kindergarten without any English language skills. So getting them the language skills and the socialization skills in a congregate setting is really, really crucial. And so that's why this additional funding for child care is so welcome. Yeah. And I think what's important is, you know, the $1.8 billion in, in child care is to help uh, expand accessibility uh, and subsidy for folks making up to 85% of the state median income. So we know that we have more families who just were not eligible um, and an additional 500 million in state dollars to continue to expand eligibility. It's all about eligibility as we, as, as we mentioned and, and folks being able to do that. Um, and then also making sure that we have $2.1 billion for excluded workers to help support, you know, the, the, the variety of resources, uh, you know, so both housing and uh, lack of employment um, uh, needs that they have been uh, excluded from receiving as a result of status. So I think that that gives a little bit of a perspective on the different issues amongst social services. Um, and I thank um, Julian uh, Harris Calvin from Vera and David Nascenti from Union Settlement for helping to shine light on, on this issue. Um, and, and not just about how we have to rebuild our, our safety net um, you know, as a result of COVID, but invest in it so that it works in different ways and, and, and help support more families that have been impacted uh, by it. And, and also um, address those underlying social inequities that have uh, you know, pervaded the criminal justice system that um, are leading to higher incidences of mental health issues, higher incidences of, 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 of folks returning ill-equipped to be able to return uh, to their communities in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I, I thank you all for the work that you do on that and we'll continue to support that in our um, in our statement of, of, of moral vision and compass our legislative budget. Um, and again, to our viewers, you have till April 1 to weigh in so that our vision, you know, my vision, the legislature's vision becomes our vision as a state. So please do that, please weigh in, please advocate. Thank you for setting forth that vision. It's it's so important. I'll go back to what I said at the beginning, uh, making the pie bigger, increasing revenues so that we're not fighting over the same scraps is so important. And then prioritization in the ways that you've described. So anything you need me or you can settle what to do to help make this happen, you just need to call. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Okay, so we'll move and, uh, and, and yeah, please everybody feel free to stay on and listen. Uh, we're introducing um, Chris Roker, who is the CEO, uh, Executive Director at Metropolitan Hospital. And we also have Dr. Aponte, the Medical Director from uh, Borinquen Health Center. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about health, what's happening in the budget. Um, as I mentioned, we have a $208 billion New York State budget um, a significant amount of that. Now, if we talk about our process, if you're just tuning in, we talked about housing, we talked about education, we talked about arts, um, we talked about social services, people with developmental disabilities, criminal justice, but on top of mind, front and center is healthcare. What is happening there? We are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we have been fortunate when we had this conversation initially in January, we were looking at dramatic cuts because we had dramatic impacts in, you know, to revenues, people are unemployed, people are not working. The federal government has since come through to the tune of almost $50 billion for the state across areas. Um, just to give the highlights, if you're tuning in for, to us for the first time, uh, they came with $12 billion of unrestricted aid, $11 billion of unrestricted aid for municipalities, including $5 billion of which goes to the city of New York. We talked about the $9.5 billion for education and the $2.6 billion for higher ed and how that would support our students um, and educators moving forward. We just recently spoke about $1.8 billion um, and uh, the $2.1 billion for excluded workers and how that supports our, our safety, our social safety net. Uh, and there's $4 billion from the federal government for vaccine uh, related expenses, testing uh, and the like. Um, just to give an overview, what this uh, you know, stimulus allows us to do is there were almost $800 million of Medicaid related cuts 
to either healthcare or, um, or, or public health programs. Um, and we were able to restore those initially. So I think that's the top line number. The first takeaway is, you know, we, we, we could not experience the cuts that we uh, were experiencing um, last year. Um, and and the, the dollars that were held back from being implemented at the same time as trying to figure out how to spend um, the, the necessary dollars to quickly get people tested and to now move into the vaccination process. So all of that uh, is where we are now. And let me take a moment to allow uh, uh, Chris Roker and to Dr. Aponte to introduce themselves. Chris, you're up first. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Assemblyman. Um, as you know, HHC uh, was at the forefront of the response of COVID-19 surge, serving the hardest hit uh, neighborhoods, including ours, right? Most vulnerable uh, population. As the pandemic continues, Metropolitan and the rest of H&H &H, uh, facilities must remain strong and prepared to offer all accessibility to high quality care um, to those who need it. Um, we are the largest public hospital system, healthcare system in the United States. We serve over 1 million people, patients a year. About 400,000 of those patients are uninsured. Um, unfortunately, you know, the executive budget has three proposals that weaken H&H &H significantly. And the future of our healthcare system must address structural inequalities in healthcare uh, funding. So briefly, three proposals stated in the budget cuts uh, that impact us is the ICP, which is the uh, indigent uh, care pool. And out of that pool, New York State distributes a total of about $3.6 billion in uh, disproportionate share uh, hospital funds, uh, including in that the subset is the 1 billion called the ICP. Uh, meant for those hospitals, which are us, who provide the disproportionate share of healthcare services to the low income Medicaid and uninsured patients. The executive budget eliminates the ICP funding for all public hospitals for the tune of cuts of about $139 million. The proposal uh, shifts the burden over to us the, uh, and local governments. Uh, and then that in turn, um, has 120, you know, H and H losing about 120 million. Out of that, Met, Metropolitan loses 7.3 million. Um, so the disproportionate, uh, the distribution of the ICP funds should be to the public and safety net hospitals uh, that serve low income and immigrant and communities of color. Then the second one is the Medicaid cuts. Uh, in the executive uh, budget. That's called the ACP, uh, ACB, I mean, ATB. Uh, and that is 1%. Uh, that's across the board uh, cuts in Medicaid for Medicaid providers. Uh, we cannot afford to have that happen again. Um, the ATP Medicaid cuts will hit H&H &H disproportionately harder. Uh, approximately 70% of H&H &H patients are on Medicaid or uninsured. H&H &H will be penalized because it serves lower income communities that are reliant on Medicaid. H&H uh, &H is also enhanced safety net provider under New York state law, public health law 2807, uh, one with a 1% uh, percentage of revenue coming from Medicaid. The 1% across the board Medicaid cut on top of last year's 1.5% reduction uh, will ultimately will be hit, uh, Metropolitan will be hit with 1.3 million on top of the previous 4.8 million. And then the third is the capital cuts. Um, the executive budget reduces capital reimbursement by 5%. This is on top of last year's 5% that is still in effect. So a total of 4.5, 4.6 million for infrastructure uh, that we really need. Uh, and you walk our hospitals, right? You know what metropolitan needs, roofs, infrastructure, pipes. Um, this is an older building. This is built in 1955. Uh, we have been maintaining it. However, it takes a lot of money to do that. 
uh, and to provide the services. And so in summary, um, you know, we need to ask that you and the assembly and the Senate reject the budget proposal to eliminate the ICP uh, for public hospitals, protect the enhanced uh, safety net providers from, uh, from the additional Medicaid cuts, reject the proposal to reduce the capital reimbursement and add in telehealth um, uh, parity for coverage and reimbursements. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. And I think it's really important for folks to, to recognize those cuts are in our resolution, but we need advocacy and folks to be tuned into this and help us push it over the finish line for April 1st, right? We're, we're, halfway, half, we're halfway through the battle and it's important for us to keep it going. Um, so thank you, Chris. But now I'm gonna switch over to Adam for a second because one of the significant uh, proposals, particularly as it impacts federally qualified healthcare uh, providers is around this 340B um, uh, proposal that's in the executive budget. And I know it means a lot to you and to Settlement Health and to a number of the other uh, providers. If you could talk a little bit about that and why that's important. Yeah, absolutely. First, thank you for having me on, Assemblyman, and greetings, Chris. Good to see you again. Great to see you. Uh, uh, you know, we keep crossing paths, which is great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, we're supposed game, to. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right. absolutely. <It's> world. <laughs> but Chris is making a tour of the whole city, I'm hearing, though, Chris. I heard about some moves you're making. Uh, you. In any event, um, you know, the Lincoln <laughs> Neighborhood Health Center located on 123rd and 3rd, Federal Qualified Health Center, as you said, Assemblyman, serving the community for over 38 years now. Um, and and at, you know, to your point, there are two things that we're, you know, keep us up at night. Uh, and one, one of the ones that you led with uh, appropriately so is the 340B program. And for those listeners who are not aware, it's basically the 340B program allows community health centers like ourselves and other safety net hospitals, Metropolitan Hospital takes advantage of this as well, to provide medications for those patients who are underinsured and uninsured at a deeply discounted rate. Uh, and without these programs, we would not be able to provide these medications. And we know some medications are extremely expensive for some of our patients. And it also allows us to, uh, we have, a, we have a, a pharmacy within our health center. So it allows us to generate a little more revenue as well for the health center to help with our operating budget. Uh, and so these cuts that are being proposed, this carve out of the 340B program into the Medicaid fee for service program is gonna move that funding away from us. And each health center and hospital is gonna feel the impact of this in terms of dollar amounts. For us personally at Berinkin, this is about a $1.5 million impact to our budget. Uh, and that's a significant portion of our operating budget. And that's gonna not allow us to, you know, have the staffing that we need to serve this community. Obviously Metropolitan, uh, Settlement Health, Berinkin, we, say we serve similar communities. We have similar challenges in these communities. And so, so with that kind of cut, um, we would feel that pain immediately. Uh, and it may impact our staffing ability, our ability to offer certain services to the community. So we're, we're grateful to hear that the Senate and the Assembly have both taken on this, this issue. Uh, the Senate has basically eliminated it. I think the Assembly has kicked it down the, the road three years. Uh, but our concern is that the governor is gonna veto it, right? And so that whether, even though the Senate and Assembly are very supportive of it, when it gets to the governor's desk, we, we anticipate a veto on that because there's a lot of dollars for the state that are involved in this. Uh, and so we, we definitely need the support of our constituents, uh, individuals like yourself, uh, Assemblyman, I know you've been very supportive of this. We've had many conversations around this issue and you're very sensitive to that. Um, we, we need folks to really understand how this is gonna affect, and particularly an organization like ours. I mean, we, we don't have the reserve that other or, uh, big places have, other health systems have. We rely on these dollars to help our community. So that's one concern. And the other one, I think, you know, I recall having a conversation with you, Assemblyman, had to do with school-based health center funding and some yes. of the cuts that we're experiencing in that. We've been operating three school-based health centers in East Harlem for, you know, over 28 years. Um, and we're getting to the point right now where because of COVID, right, we have a sort of double whammy where COVID has impacted our revenues because children are not in the schools and we generate revenue from visits as well as the cuts that have already been placed on school-based health centers. Uh, that's sort of a double whammy that we're experiencing. And, you know, for the first time, Barikin is like, can we stay in this business? Um, and, and that's a big concern because we know that school-based health centers play a critical role in providing access to health care for many kids who don't otherwise have primary care providers. So those are the things that keep us up at night at Barikin. 
I think it's important because the, the issue that you raise is not just Puerto Rican, it's Settlement Health, it's Family Health Institute, it's all of our FQHCs. You know, so we may pride ourselves on having a, a robust network of providers in our community, but you know, it, 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 they would all feel it, you know, whether we're talking about, um, uh, uh, so, so all of our providers are, are, are impacted. When we talk about some of the other areas that we've restored, I'm happy that we were able to restore the school-based health clinics. One area that, that it always kind of baffles me why you would try to cut this, but early intervention, you know, is one of those areas that we always fight to restore um, because of the tremendous impact. If you're able to identify, you know, a potential issue, learning disability, any kind of disability early and remediate it, you know, you change somebody's life, you know, you change the, the trajectory of their healthcare um, career, but, uh, you know, of their, of their, of the healthcare um, life cycle, but, um, you know, inevitably they are always facing the most difficult um, uh, bureaucracies to either get paid, funded, uh, reimbursed, uh, you know, in, in some of the arcane ways that, 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 that folks go about supporting this system. But um, if anybody wants to comment on that, you're yeah, welcome no, to. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, as a pediatrician, right, that one really hits home for me, right? This is really a, a, a no-brainer for us, right? It's like that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and to your point, right, we know, we have documented this in literature, that earlier that we intervene with children as far as providing early intervention services, and for, the, for those listeners that don't know, this includes occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, um, really taking those kids who have these developmental delays early on and addressing them while the, while the brain is still very plastic and, and adaptable. This is a critical period of time between zero and three years old that if you put in that, that sort of time and effort and those, put those, provide those services, the outcomes for these children are gonna be much, much better. And then the consequence of not doing that is that these children will then become a burden to us in terms of healthcare because they'll have a lot of issues either healthcare wise or educationally as well that's gonna require much more resources, not only down the road, but for their entire lifespan. So you're taking three years, investing in three years, getting great outcomes, and if not, you're paying for that for the rest of the lifespan of that individual. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know, uh, as Adam Adam talks about, you know, it's a small world. We all work together. Just because we might be the big public system, but we rely on all of our partners, you know, our community-based partners, our FQHC partners, um, it does take a village to take care of patients, right? And it doesn't matter if they're small or if they're, you know, adults. Um, but we need those funds to constantly flow through because it does take a lot um, to take care of a patient, right? Mm -hmm. how, how many people touch the patient, especially the special needs patients, right? Um, you talked about earlier in your discussion about um, education and you know um, uh, mental health, right? And so mental health, you know, that is the bread and butter of our public health system, right? H and H has been a, a leader in mental health. And can you imagine taking funds away and not having the programs that you that this community so needs, right? So it's very interesting. Um, it, you know, a dollar uh, taken away will cost so much more in the long run. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into you know the biggest issue on everybody's mind. You know, when we first started with COVID. It was all about testing. And, uh, you know, we were documenting and pushing, you know, are we available? Is testing available? Metropolitan, you know, was one was at the forefront of trying to deliver, you know, testing solutions, um, you know, to the community. Uh, all of our FQHCs have ramped up to be able to do that in, in, you know, what is the earlier phase of the pandemic, but now we're moving into the vaccination process. Um, if you guys can shed light on kind of your experiences, I mean, we know that the rollout has been less than Far from perfect, far from perfect. Um, but where are we at now? Um, what can people expect? You know, what's what's really happening in, in the institutions for people who are eligible to sign up? Um, you know, and, and and then of course, you know, you know, we 
the advocacy part uh, is, 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 is my job. And, and I know we've, we're working on, on pushing the state to do better, but what's happening on the ground, guys? So we'll, we'll, let, we'll let Chris, you can go first on this one. Sure. So it was a bumpy start um, <clears throat> for many different reasons. Uh, you know, let's talk about Moderna and, and Pfizer. Great vaccines. However, how you roll it out and how you have to store it, um, pretty difficult, right? So sub-freezing temperatures that you have to then take time and make sure that you have the time to thaw them out. And then there's a particular time in which you have to use them. If you don't use them in that time frame, you lose them. Uh, and then also um, getting an appointment was just absolutely um, uh, less than stellar, put it that way. And uh, we, we've gone through those iterations and I think we're in a better place. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, Assemblyman, we are doing approximately about 280 to 300 vaccinations a day at our small vaccine center. And now we're um, planning on rolling it out for our primary care setting uh, where patients will come in, see their doctor, and then have the ability, if they want it, which we hope that they will, and listen to their doctors, we will be actually um, vaccinating patients right in our clinic. So we're doing much better. Uh, and then the rollout of J&J &J will help it even better in terms of the mental health side of things. When patients are in our hospital for a short stay, we can actually vaccinate them and they don't have to uh, come back for a second shot. With Moderna and Pfizer, you have to come back for a second shot. Um, it will also help the FQHCs. And I know that Adam can talk more about that because they don't have to invest in sub-freezers to uh, hold these, these vaccines. Yeah. So, so, you know, the FQHC experience was, was a little so different. Adam, before you go into that, I think it's super important to talk about, like while we're talking about rollouts and things that are maybe less than stellar, can you just give us a, a quick two or three minutes on why it's so important that everybody get vaccinated nonetheless? Mm -hmm. They go through whatever process they have to go right. to, but just right. if you could share why they need to do this. Uh, wow. That, and that, safety and, and, and the safety. That, that, that's, that's a little... You can take more time. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> you put me on the spot. Two minutes. Two minutes. The elevator speech. But you know what? I, I, I've actually been doing no, no, a lot you got of time. We, we've actually been doing a lot of this, Assemblyman, because quite frankly, the uptick initially was not tremendous, even amongst our own staff, because of a lot of concerns that people have expressed around how quickly these vaccines came to market, concerns about safety, efficacy profiles, long-term effects. So, so reasonably, you know, people had a lot of questions. And I think what's important is that we've done a tremendous job of making sure that we're educating folks about the real facts, not the myths associated with this, but the real facts around this vaccine and why, you know, in, in 2021, as a physician, as a scientist, my expectation is that we can actually get things to the market quicker, but the public is not, uh, thinks that we're taking shortcuts in that respect. So having a very candid conversation around that was something we had to do critically. And of course, you know, I think it's really obvious why we're trying to vaccinate, right? We, we have been in this state of flux for over a year now where, you know, people are isolated, socially isolated. It's causing all kinds of mental health issues. Businesses are closing. I heard, you know, the earlier parts of your conversations, Assemblyman, you know, a lot of issues for you and, and for the communities as far as the economic impact of this. And so if we want to get back to a new sense of normal, because I'm not sure what normal is going to be now beyond the COVID vaccine, but I know normal is not us having to stay six feet apart from our grandparents. I know normal is not being able to visit our loved ones in nursing homes. That's not normal for us, right? Because we're social beings. We need to connect. And so how do we reconnect? The way that we reconnect is making, making sure that we get vaccinated. And when you get vaccinated, I want you to think about the people you love as the reason that you're getting vaccinated, not just for yourself. I had COVID very early on, back in March of last year, I got COVID, but I also elected to make sure when the vaccine was available, that I was the first one in my health center to let people know that I'm standing up to make sure I get vaccinated. We actually did a little PSA. And one of the reasons I got vaccinated is because my mother has cancer and I want to be able to visit my mother. So think about your grandmothers, your children, your loved ones, those people in your family that have you know, chronic conditions that if they get COVID, despite where we are today in comparison to remember those early days, Chris and H&H, &H, right? Uh, it, was, it was a disaster uh, in terms of what we were seeing then. 
we've come a long way, but people are still dying every single day from this, particularly these vulnerable populations. So even if you're not doing it necessarily for yourself, this is the one vaccine you're doing for other people. Uh, so so that's, that's my response to that assemblyman. And then, you know, to the rollout, uh, it was very bumpy for us as FQHCs. Uh, first of all, we didn't even entertain Pfizer. We couldn't afford to get these very ultra cold storage units. We don't have the space for them. Uh, so we had to wait for the Moderna product to come online before we became eligible. Fortunately, became eligible uh, very shortly after Pfizer, but but the distribution was a challenge for FQHCs, uh, and we were getting sporadic supplies infrequently. We didn't know where they were getting, and then then the state started making all these restrictions uh, about how you had to use it, how many you had to use per day, and if you don't, and, and threatening us, literally threatening us that if we didn't dispense this vaccine in a certain amount of time, we would get cut off in terms of the supply, and and and. What we don't have time to talk about this morning uh, or this afternoon is the amount of coordination it takes just to administer one vaccine. This is not like coming in for a flu shot. I give it to you in your arm and you go, you go on your merry way. There is so much coordination that is involved in this vaccine. I can't open a vial until I have 10 people ready to get a vaccine. That's number one. I got to make sure that they're coming. I got to make sure they're going to come back in four weeks. There's a multitude of forms that have to be completed, including online forms. Our communities don't do very well with that, right? And then they started opening up these mega centers throughout the city. And those mega centers started to divert vaccine away from our communities. And, and quite frankly, I made noise about this with the Manhattan Borough President. East Harlem was particularly hard hit by that because if you look at those sites, they weren't opening up mega cent sites in our community. They were opening up in all, 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 the closest one to us was in in Washington Heights. And we all know what happened with the armory in Washington Heights and who got the vaccines there. It wasn't our community. It was folks who are very savvy, who know how to navigate this process, can open up several browsers at a time and get an appointment and get in there. And that's not what our community, the Doña that lives across the street in Taino Towers, she's not gonna get on the internet to try to make these appointments. And so uh, finally, I, I would like to say that uh, we are finally in the her the, the the, the federal government distribution program now, thanks to many individuals, including yourself and Senator Schumer and our local, uh, our councilwoman, Diana Ayala, and some community board folks, we actually got in there. So we're going to start getting direct supply of, of vaccine finally, so that we can really take on the responsibility that we know is ours. And our responsibility is to vaccinate East Harlem. We want to make sure that our surrounding community, the people who work there, live there in that community, we want to take responsibility for taking care of that community. And, and we, we see a light at the end of the tunnel, and we're going to collaborate with Taino Towers on this in endeavor to try to stand up a satellite site that's going to allow a small health center like ours to vaccinate you know, upwards of at least 100 people a day. That's significant for us. I think that's huge, and I think that's the moment that we've been waiting for is enough supply to be able to do the uh, to take us outside of the walls of our institution to allow us to go to um, the Casabe houses, the Upaca houses, you know, who are right, right, right down the street, not far, you know, but we know that we can, we can, we can go out there, you know, set up in the, in the, in the community room, you know, and, and, and properly administer, you know, set up in, in different locations and be able to properly administer. We have Casita Maria in, in Carver houses ready to go. We have, um, you know, uh, locations near Wagner houses. And I think those are the partnerships that we have been looking to, to establish um, more regularly uh, and have been limited by supply. So I think that's, you know, that's, we, we have to turn that corner. And just one other thing, th these mega sites are not going to be attractive to many of the residents in our community, right? I don't sure. see that viejita from across the street from Taino going to Javits Center, and waiting three hours online to go to this very sterile cold place. People don't even speak her language, don't understand her, can't help her out, fill out the forms. We help people fill out forms, consent forms, right? We help them do the registration uh, in terms of all, all those things that they need to do, do the V-safe for the CDC tracking. They don't know how to do that. These sites are not set up to really embrace patients as places like ours do, right? We know these communities, Chris, right? We know how they interact um, and we're very familiar with them. And that's critical to making sure that people come in because they trust us. And trust we, have to go to, we have to go to them. I mean, yep. that's, that's the, the most uh, important thing. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to being out of time, but I do want to talk to emphasize and, and, and let my experts weigh in. It is a race against time. I mean, I think we're all seeing some of the stuff about variants, you know, entering the conversation. Um, if, if you could just talk about why why variants matter and and, and why vaccinations uh, are, are are so important with the with that new science uh, emerging. 
Yeah, let me lead off on that. I mean, I, I think the variants are inevitable. Viruses always mutate. Um, and so the longer they're out there in the community, the longer they sort of duplicate and replicate, at some point in time, they will inevitably become variants. And those variants can then impact the efficacy of the vaccines we have. And so uh, it's really important that we have these three vaccines that are very effective. And I don't want people to be dismayed by the efficacy of Johnson & Johnson. It's really comparing apples to oranges. Johnson & Johnson went to uh, do their trials during a different time where there were more variants, whereas, whereas Pfizer and Moderna, there really were no variants at the time that they were doing their studies. So, but, but all of these are very effective at, uh, and almost 100% effective at, uh, you know, in terms of death from COVID, right? That, which is ultimately what we want to try to avoid. Uh, so whatever vaccine you can get folks, don't wait for one over the other, whichever one you can get in your arm when you're eligible, please roll up your sleeves and get that. And the sooner we get that herd immunity, the sooner we, we, we decrease the amount of uh, replication of this virus in the community, the less that these variants will then perpetuate. And that's what, so that's the race against time that you're describing, right? So the more folks that get vaccinated, the fewer these times that these viruses have an opportunity to mutate and become more virulent to the point where that surface protein, which is where we're attacking, that's the last thing we want to really change. Because once that changes, it changes everything. None of these vaccines are gonna be effective at that point. And inevitably over time, we will get there if we don't put a curve to it now. Well said. I know that was super important for us to get in and maybe a little bit of a divergence from the money <laughs> part of the budget conversation. But while I have viewers, you know, it's that important message to get out there that that four billion dollars that we're getting for the federal government is for that is for that purpose, the race against time so that our providers have what they need to be able to vaccinate and that people actually go out there and do it. Um, so I think that brings us close to time on the health um, portion, um, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, Chris Roker and from Metropolitan Hospital, our, our beloved uh, you know, h and Institute. I was born there, um, I was born and, there, and Chris. From <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone has a story. Everybody knows them. Right, right. everyone has to a save story. it. So, uh, yep. And if you, yeah, that that that's that's your mark of being, you know, El Barrio resident. Right. Um, so I just wanted to thank you guys for being here and really knowing um, that we're 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 going to support the healthcare infrastructure in our community as much as we can, and that this budget does that. But as we as we wrap up. I just want to thank everybody who's tuning in to this important discussion uh, and remind them the budget's not final. We still have two weeks, final negotiations, April 1st, to make this budget you know, a reality or to make other improvements or changes that people think are necessary, right? This is the moment to chime in, to weigh in. Governor started the conversation. We added our two cents to the conversation on Monday, and now we've got to finish it up between now and April 1st. So please feel free to reach out to our office. You can use social media, Facebook, Twitter, email, old school telephone, my number is 212-828-3953. Make sure that we know what, what issue is important to you. Circle back around, we, we did this in four segments so you can uh, you know hang out for 30 minutes at a time and, and, and get briefed. Uh, and so if you missed part of it, um, thanks for tuning in and engaging in this important instruction. Again, I'm Assembly Member Robert Rodriguez. I represent the 68th Assembly District in East Harlem. And again, our state budget is not final. Right now is the time to reach out to make sure that your voice is heard between now and April 1st or when decisions are made. So if you agree with this budget, make sure you make your voice heard. If you want us to do other things, please reach out, make sure your voice is heard. But nonetheless, you can do it via email, social media, Twitter, Facebook, or just call us. My number is 212-828-3953. And I look forward to hearing uh, from you between now and April 1st to make sure that we prioritize our community in this budget and we do it now.